Hello friends, Duncan here. In this video, I'll give you 10 tips that you need to know as a U.S. citizen traveling to Cuba. In addition to that, watch to the end. I'll give you three bonus tips. Thanks for watching. Hello friends, I'm Duncan. I'm a traveler and explorer, and I love to tell the stories of my experiences. I just returned from Cuba recently and had a wonderful time there. Spent the majority of my time in Havana, but also spent two days out in the beautiful Vinales Valley. I produced a couple of YouTube videos, so please go take a look at those, and I've got several more videos that are on the way. So please like and subscribe so that you can get all the latest episodes. I should mention that I previously recorded and published this video. However, I got some feedback that the background sound wasn't too good. I recorded it in a Starbucks, and therefore I am re-recording it and will be issuing it here in this video. So according to the U.S. State Department, there are 12 valid reasons for U.S. citizens to visit Cuba. So please take a look at those 12 reasons and make sure that you meet the criteria for the category that you select. For me personally, I selected support for the Cuban people because really that was the overall purpose of my trip was to visit a lot of the places in Cuba and get to know the Cuban people a little bit better. So you'll also need to get a tourist card. So I'll include a link for that. You can get that from your airline as you make your airline booking. For example, I booked through Delta. They included a link in their website that took me directly to the site to purchase the the tourist card, so it's really fairly simple. I purchased it online. I had it expedited to my house so that I would make sure to get it before I left for my trip. But you can also purchase it in the airport, in the Miami airport, for example. Cost is about $100. It's really very simple, very easy. There's only a couple of lines of information on the card that you have to fill out. So you'll need to complete that card, have it with you, and that card will be collected upon your departure from Cuba. So what I would do is keep that card in your passport. The second thing that you'll need is something known as the Di Viajeros. I'll include a link for it here, but it's a website that you need to go to. It's only available online. You can only complete it 48 hours prior to your departure. You go into the website, you complete the information. It's a little bit more extensive than the tourist card, and it will also ask you some COVID questions and some things like that. When you complete that process, they will mail you a document that contains a QR code. I would highly suggest that you print that document out Put that also in your passport. And when you come to the Cuban border security folks, they will scan that QR code. They will make sure that everything is in order and allow you entry into Cuba. So pretty straightforward process. Once you get into the country, you will not need that form again. Next topic has to do with communications and specifically cell phones. What I would highly recommend is that you get a Cuban SIM card. You can get it from the link that I will provide right here. You can get it from Cubacell, which is the Cuban cell phone company. And at this link, you must do this in advance. And basically you can purchase a SIM card. I believe it was $39. I think it included six gigabytes of, of data. And when you get into Cuba, after you go through customs, you will find a Cubacell kiosk where they will actually assist you to put the SIM card in your phone and like that you will have cell phone service in Cuba. It's really very quick and very easy and it will give you immediately cell phone coverage in Cuba. Let me point out that most of the vendors in Cuba use WhatsApp. So by having cell phone service, you're able to communicate with those folks and that's extremely important as you're in Cuba and things change or you're trying to arrange transportation, whatever it might be. So I would highly recommend you do it. Very easy. Your SIM card, you can recharge the data on there if you need to, if you're, if you're running low on data. So please write down your username and password as you log into the system to set up your account. And it's very 
quick, very easy to be able to go back into the system and top off your data if needed. Topic number four has to do with Wi-Fi. What I found that as I was staying in the family-run hotel that I was at that they had Wi-Fi that was sufficient for communication and web updates, that type of thing. It wasn't anything blazing fast, but it was certainly enough to be able to keep in touch. So I did travel with my iPad. I did not use cell service on my iPad. I simply used my iPad for Wi-Fi connection only. I should point out that also in a number of the public parks, Wi-Fi is available. However, you will need a Wi-Fi card in order to do that. So the kiosk that I mentioned uh, coming in through the airport, they sell the Wi-Fi cards. I believe it was one US dollar for one hour of service. I did buy two hours or two cards from the kiosk. However, what I found was that the whole time I was there, I really did not use that. I simply used the Wi-Fi that was provided in the hotel. And again, I found that sufficient for everything that I was doing in general web browsing. So I would go that way. Wi-Fi is not always available in all hotels, so please check with your accommodation to find out if it's available there. It's also been reported in some places that there are Wi-Fi outages. I did not experience that in my accommodation, but I know that that is a fact of life in Cuba. So just be aware of that, that the speed and the availability of Wi-Fi may not be what you're accustomed to at home. So the next very important topic, topic number five, has to do with currency and money exchange. And the first thing that you need to know is that there is an official and an unofficial exchange rate in Cuba. When I was there in July of 2024, the official exchange rate was 110 Cuban pesos for one US dollar. And the unofficial exchange rate, or what they call the black market rate, was 350 Cuban pesos for one US dollar. So as you can see, there is a huge difference between the official and the unofficial exchange rate. So, so when I got to the Havana airport, I did exchange a very limited amount of US dollars into Cuban pesos, just so that I would have some Cuban pesos in my pocket. But if you do that, I would limit it to a very small amount for example, 20 US dollars or 50 US dollars, that's it. The family run hotel or Casa Particularis, and I'll get to accommodations in a minute, they can help you exchange money from US dollars into Cuban pesos, and they can do it at a much more favorable rate. So please be sure to ask what the exchange rate is so that you can optimize your buying power while you are there. So another important thing to note is that U.S. credit cards will not work in Cuba. So you need to bring cash to pay for everything. So for my one week trip in Cuba, not including my accommodations, which I'll get to in a minute, I brought a little bit over a thousand dollars. And for the one week, I brought about a hundred dollars back with me. So I found that that amount of money was sufficient, but certainly you will need to bring more than what you think you will spend and budget and monitor your cash accordingly. Next is topic number six, dealing with taxis and transportation. So the first important point is make sure that you discuss with the taxi driver where you wanna go and what the total all-inclusive fare would be, either in US dollars or in Cuban pesos. A lot of places will gladly accept US dollars, but beware of the exchange rate that they might be using. They might say that they will take US dollars, but then give you the official exchange rate, which again could have a huge impact on your buying power. So please make sure you negotiate that fare in advance and also that that fare is applicable for everyone in your party and it's not a per person fare. What I would definitely recommend while you're in Cuba is to find a taxi driver that you can trust and you can rely on and book them in advance for any tours that you want to make. Many of them are also tour guides. They can give you a lot of really valuable information about the places you want to go. A lot of them can open doors as well. That's one thing that we found is that 
our taxi driver had a lot of connections and can certainly provide you with a lot of good tips about where to go based on what you want to see. I will include in this description below uh, a link to the taxi driver that I used, a gentleman by the name of Yudas Fail, and he was really a tremendous asset the entire time that we were there. And definitely book it, book in advance, book one day in advance or half a day in advance to try to make sure that uh, they're available. And if they're not available, they can probably recommend someone who can help you out. You'll also find in many locations a lot of these beautiful classic cars. So many of them are convertibles and they would love to take you out on a city tour, a tour of the Malacan, whether that's a one hour, two hour, three hour, whatever you would prefer. There are some sites like the Central Park, for example, that's a little bit further out. But definitely talk to the taxi driver, get a feeling for where you would like to go and definitely lock in the rate in advance so that you know exactly what you're getting into and that it is all inclusive. I did take a city tour the first day that I was there that was prearranged through the hotel that I stayed at and their concierge and uh, really enjoyed that, was really able to see some of the main sites and definitely uh, riding through Havana in a convertible, especially on the Malacan was really a special treat that I got to enjoy. Next category is category seven, accommodations. And let me first say that most of the hotels in Cuba, almost all of the hotels in Cuba are owned and run by the Cuban government. You will find in the link that I've got listed here, you will find a link to the U.S. government's blacklist for U.S. hotels. So those are locations where U.S. citizens are prohibited to stay. And instead, what I would recommend is family-run hotels, which are also known as Casa Particularas. And there's a lot of great places to stay that are scattered across Havana and scattered across Cuba based on where you're going and where you would like to stay, what general vicinity that you would like to stay in. Personally, what I do on all my travels, whether it's in Cuba or other locations, is I heavily use two websites. The first one is Expedia, and the second one is TripAdvisor. These two websites are great locations to get generally unbiased reviews of the places that you're thinking about so that you can make an informed decision. I have heard, and just in reading some of them, I do believe some of them are not totally unbiased, but some of them are even paid advertisements. And uh, therefore, please take a look at those, read everything with a grain of salt, and make a educated decision about where you would like to stay. For me personally, I knew that I wanted to stay in the old Havana neighborhood, so Habana Vieja. And in looking at TripAdvisor and Expedia, I found a place with a lot of great reviews, and that was a place called Residencia Santa Clara. I will be doing a review of that a little bit later, so stay tuned to my channel. Please like and subscribe, and make sure that you catch all the latest episodes to be able to get the latest information that I have and get this hotel review. But I really enjoyed that. It was a great small what I would call boutique family run hotel, seven rooms, had a great little restaurant and bar downstairs, breakfast was included, and I really enjoyed that. Uh, let me say also that this video is not sponsored or affiliated by anyone. I paid out of my pocket for all the excursions and for my accommodations, so please rest assured that you're getting my unbiased opinion about the hotel but definitely take a look at TripAdvisor and Expedia to be able to get good reviews. Now, the other benefit with that is that you can book your accommodation online. That's very important to do that. Basically, all costs are included. You can book it online from the convenience of your home before you leave, and therefore that is cash that you do not have to bring with you and that's one huge expense as part of your trip that you won't have to worry about while you're traveling. Now the Casa Particularis, just a few words on that. 
These are family-run accommodations. Sometimes it's a room in somebody's house. Sometimes it's a separate house that's owned by a family that maybe lives next door or somewhere close by. It would be like an Airbnb. Airbnb is another source of great places to stay and would highly recommend that. I've read a lot of great reviews about people who have stayed in the Casa Particulares and have really enjoyed it. But please do your homework, do your research, and buyer beware. Tip number eight has to do with government-owned businesses. What I will include here is a link to the U.S. Department of State blacklist of hotels in Cuba. Any hotel that is owned and operated by the Cuban government, it is prohibited by the State Department for U.S. citizens to stay there. So please keep that in mind. Uh, definitely as you're going, there are lots of other options. I mentioned about my accommodation that I did, which was a family-owned, what I would call a boutique hotel, but there's also the Casa Particulares. There's also a number of the restaurants that are also Cuban-owned, and those particularly, some of them may not accept U.S. credit cards, and they may accept U.S. dollars, but again, may offer you the official exchange rate, which at the time I was there was 110 Cuban, Cuban pesos per one U.S. dollar. So certainly ask before you get committed in any restaurant if they accept U.S. dollars or Cuban pesos and specifically what the exchange rate is. So we're getting close to the end. So tip number nine has to do with bathrooms, and this is also very important. So realize that almost all of the bathrooms that you go to will not have toilet paper. So you should bring toilet paper or Kleenex with you so that you can take care of that. A lot of places will also not have hand towels, so paper goods in general are short supply. I did find electronic hand dryers in a lot of locations, so, so that was pretty good. Did find soap as well in most locations, not all. So please be prepared for that. Several locations as well, no toilet seats. So some of those creature comforts just will not be there. So please be prepared and be aware of that. A lot of bathrooms as well will have attendants. So be prepared to give them a small tip. Typically, I would give them 500 Cuban pesos or maybe 1,000 Cuban pesos if I didn't have anything smaller or one U.S. dollar as a tip, they will gladly accept that, and that goes to help clean the facilities. And in general, I would say that all of the bathrooms that I went to in restaurants or other public locations were clean and in very good condition, albeit no paper goods. And topic number 10, scams and beggars. So please be aware that as you're walking on the streets in Havana or other cities, you will stick out like a sore thumb and you will be approached by a multitude of people looking for handouts or looking to try to help. The way the conversation typically goes is they will approach you, they will say, you know, hey, how's it, how's it going? Where are you from? They'll get into a dialogue about that and try to engage you in a little bit of discussion. Then it will become, you know, what are you looking for? Are you looking for Cuban cigars? Are you looking for some Cuban rum? Do you want to go to a jazz club? Whatever it might be, they will definitely try to engage you on that, engage you on maybe tours that you want to take, if you want to take a, a tour in a classic car, and realize that all of these people are salesmen, and they, they are working to get a cut of your U.S. dollars that you're bringing into the country. And oftentimes they'll want to take you to a fantastic seafood restaurant, which will typically be remote or out of the way, and they'll take you to this remote location. Of course, it's going to be one of their friend's restaurants. They'll want to take you there, and oftentimes they will want you to pay them instead of paying the restaurant, and they will, of course, get a cut of the, of the bill. And there are some good businessmen, there are some very honest people down there, so this in any way is not meant to be a blanket statement against these people, but just realize that a lot of folks are going to want to try to help you to be able to 
earn some of your so as these people approach you, if you simply say, you know, no gracias or no thank you, they will go on about their way and they'll leave you alone. So not a big deal at the end of the day, but certainly know what you're looking for before you get out on the street, because again, they will pick you out and start to engage with you for sure. So the other part of this has to do with beggars. So there will be a lot of people on the street that are looking for food or looking for some type of hand out a few pesos or a dollar or something like that and just be aware that if you decide to do that that there are typically a lot of other people watching you and if they see you giving a, a beggar or someone like that a small donation or something like that that you will be immediately hit up by other people. So just be aware that you are you're being watched and be careful about what you do. And it's very uh, it's a very touching, heartwarming thing and not to be able to help everyone that you run into. So another situation to look out for is beggars at sidewalk cafes. So the number of sidewalk cafes, I recall a situation that I ran into, stopped into La Inglaterra hotel at their little sidewalk cafe to grab something cold to drink and realize that the sidewalk cafes are right adjacent to the sidewalk. And you will find a lot of times that the beggars will come right up to you right at the sidewalk. And we had one gentleman that had his little change cup with a couple of coins in it and kind of almost shook shook that right in your face as you're sitting there so just be aware of where you're sitting if you go to a sidewalk cafe that you could easily be approached so uh, just be aware of that so if you've stayed with me through these 10 tips so far i really want to thank you you are some of the real ones and just for you what i would like to do is to give you three bonus tips so the first bonus tip is to bring some things to give away to kids that you run into. And one of the most popular things that I found was coloring books. So find coloring books that maybe have a marker attached with them or bring crayons, something like that. They really enjoyed that. That gives them something to do. Also learning activities and that type of thing that maybe they don't have exposure to in their home life and their family life. So I found that that was an extremely popular thing to bring. Another thing to bring is toothbrush and toothpaste kits. So I found at my local drugstore some kits. They came in a little package that had that included in there. And those also were extremely well received. And again, maybe something that they don't have available to them quite so often in their home life. And then another example would be lollipops, that these would be things that you could give away. Let me also give you a caution with this, is that be very careful and also be discreet about giving these things away to kids on the street because as you do this, the other children will be watching. And as soon as, the, as, soon as these other children see that you're handing out gifts, you will immediately be attacked by quite a number of other kids also looking for handouts. So definitely look for the right opportunities, look for the most deserving people to be able to do that. I was able to do that in a couple of different situations and really gratifying to be able to provide something for, for the kids. So I typically did not fil film them. I did take one photo of one of the family that I gave it to and they were extremely appreciative and that was really good. So the, se the second bonus tip is to allow plenty of time at the Havana airport. So I would recommend three hours. And the reason for that is that when I was there, there were quite a number of people that had problems with their passports or their documents or whatever it might be. And there were a lot of delays. And there was also a medical situation where actually one of the one of the customs screeners actually fainted in the booth and had to be pulled out of there. And in general, there's gonna be a lot of delays behind that. So my advice to you is just to allow plenty of time in advance, take it easy, enjoy it, take a deep breath and understand that it's part of the process and it's gonna take a while. 
And as part of that, what I would also recommend is as you go through customs, you go through the magnetometer, down the stairs on the left-hand side is the VIP lounge. Cost $35 per person. There's comfortable chairs, there's electrical outlets, there's Wi-Fi, there's food, there's drinks, there's coffee, and most importantly, there's air conditioning. And it's a great place to sit and relax and wait for your flight without having any time pressure behind it. They will actually notify you when it's time to board your flight. From the lounge to the gate is literally two to three minutes, so you're not far away at all. Airport is relatively small, but I would definitely recommend the getting to the airport early and also to visit the VIP lounge in the Havana Airport. And my final bonus tip for you has to do with bringing Cuban cigars and Cuban rum back into the United States. And my recommendation to you is don't do it. I have seen a lot of people that have attempted to do that, that their Cuban cigars have been confiscated. And certainly you don't want to buy a box of $40 per stick Cohibas and then have those taken by customs. I've heard other stories where people have been able to bring cigars back through. They've been inspected and it's clear that they were for personal consumption. However, my experience and what I have heard and what I have read is that they are not allowed. So please avoid the hassle and avoid the waste and don't attempt to bring Cuban cigars or Cuban rum back into the country, no matter what they might tell you while you're in Cuba. So have you traveled to Cuba? Are there other things that you would recommend as well? I tried to limit this list to just the essential topics. However, I found that uh, after going through the 10 most important topics that I ended up with three left over, so I did the three bonus tips. Cuba is really a great country and I really enjoyed my time there and meeting the Cuban people. It's really a fantastic place. However, they are facing quite a number of economic and political challenges and I would definitely recommend to to visit the country to know what you're getting into and to experience Cuba for yourself.